In the name of Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In this epiphany season, when Jesus manifests his glory, we saw him bring his glory to our youth and childhood. Being a perfect human being, growing like all natural human beings, he sanctified and glorified human childhood for us. And today, we see him bringing his glory to marriage. While Jesus was never married himself, he shows here his love for that institution. He is himself the God who designed marriage in the perfect world before the fall, and he would repeat the saying, that the Maker made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, man must not separate. But now saying Jesus himself was never married is not entirely accurate. The bride of Christ is the church, whom he loved and gave himself up for. So here in his first miracle, Jesus brings abundant joy to bless the marriage and to reveal his glory. There was a problem at the way. The wine was gone. This would have brought a lot of shame to the groom according to the social norms of the day. The wedding festivities were a long and raucous affair, and it was expected if the newlywed husband was able to provide for his new bride, he would be able to to provide wine for many guests for days for this wedding celebration. Running out of wine wasn't just an inconvenience. It would have been a curse on the whole marriage. Jesus was only a guest at this celebration. It's likely his mother was related to the groom, and so Jesus himself was also a relation. When the wine ran out, that wasn't Jesus' problem, though. It was solely the responsibility of the groom to provide the wine. But Mary shows that she knew where to go for help. She came to her son and told him they have no wine. And even when his dismissive response seemed as though it was hopeless to go to him, she confidently told those servants, do whatever he tells you. And this is our confession. That whatever the gospel tells us, we receive its promises. Mary confessed in her song, in her Magnificat, He has lifted up the, whole, the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And this son of Mary was the son of God who had the power to perform these great miracles. He was the word of God who was with God in the beginning, who was himself true God. He came, as he would say, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. It was a perfectly acceptable pious and appropriate petition of Mary's to ask Jesus to bless this wedding. That theme of exalting the humble. Jesus' miracle of wine comes from an unexpected place. Six stone water jars, which the Jews used for ceremonial cleansing, were standing there, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. But this wasn't drinking water. This was foot-washing water. When Jesus told the servants, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet, that would have sounded absolutely absurd. Can you imagine how badly those servants might be punished? Or how much worse shame would come upon that groom if the master of the banquet was made to drink filthy water for foot washing? But the servants obeyed. Mary told them, do whatever he tells you. Jesus' command, seeming absurd, must be good and right. So with that confidence, they followed through. And there the miracle was fulfilled. The master of the banquet called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the guests have had plenty to drink, then the cheaper wine. You saved the good wine until now. It wasn't just wine, it was good wine. And there was a lot of it. Each of those six water jars held 20 or 30 gallons, making for about 120 to 180 gallons of wine, or 600 to 900 bottles worth of wine made by Jesus in this miracle. So Jesus changes the humblest of circumstances. 
into the most blessed. This is the complete reversal that he offers to all people. The Beatitudes in his Sermon on the Mount are full of this kind of reversal. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. This is his promise. Now remember, Jesus' bride is the church. Human marriages are patterned after his marriage to his people. Paul wrote, Husbands, love your wives in the same way as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water in connection with the word. He did this so that he could present her to himself as a glorious church, having no stain or wrinkle or any such thing, but so that she would be holy and blameless. Jesus gave that reversal to his church. He gives that reversal also to you. You were dead and lost in your sin. But Jesus places his life and his glory into your hands and into your heart. I want you to notice a trend in the lectionary here. The readings that have been included since Christmas show a pattern. On the nativity of our Lord, Mary and Joseph were central in the Gospel reading. Jesus, while true God, was still dependent upon his human parents. And the Sundays after Christmas included the flight into Egypt when his parents carried him from danger. But since Epiphany, Mary and Joseph have started fading into the background. The Magi worships Jesus while his parents were there looking on. Then Jesus went to the temple, and his parents were worried because Jesus was taking care of his father's business. As he has grown, as he approaches the time that he will fulfill God's design at the hour of his glory, his parents have faded. Mary is here, but this is about the last time she takes an active role in the gospel. This fulfills that design for Mary. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother, and will remain united with his wife, and they will become one flesh. Jesus is leaving his father and his mother to be joined to his wife, his church, giving her, giving you, all his glory. He said here, my time has not come yet, that is the time of his glory, when he would accomplish that salvation for all people. That occurred when he was hanging on the cross, bleeding out his wine-red blood to sanctify us. And on that cross, he bid a farewell to his mother. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time, this disciple took her into his own home. Just as he provided that rich wine at the wedding in Cana, he has provided the wine for his own bride. But it's much more than simple wine. He gave a feast. And in that feast, he literally gave himself. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And just as a groom makes vows and promises to his bride, Jesus promised us, and surely I am with you always until the end of the age. Among us are many other promises through which Jesus gives us forgiveness, life, and salvation. And even more, as the groom gives all of his possessions to his bride, Jesus gives us all that is his. Cleansing her with the washing of water in connection with the word, he did this so that he could present her to himself as a glorious church, having no stain or wrinkle or any such thing, but so that she would be holy and blameless. And therefore, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the guarantee of a good conscience before God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus gives you what he promised. In my Father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me, so that you may also be where I am. When we say that the season of Epiphany is about Jesus revealing his glory, therefore this is a message of hope. It's the glory of a bridegroom. We're anticipating that marriage day when we receive all the blessings that he's already giving to us now. We think of glory as a shining light. As the angels are described on that Christmas night appearing to the shepherds, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. St. John records the glory of God in the new Jerusalem. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, because the glory of God has given it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. While at this wedding in Cana, it wasn't yet time for Jesus to be glorified, but he did give a glimpse of his glory. This miracle wasn't something that any human being can do, but it's a miracle of joy. The glory of God comes in the man, Jesus, to give joy to poor, sinful human beings. This is something that he brings near to us so that we can grasp it. Even when God shined his glory on Mount Sinai, terrifying and full of thunder and fire, he was there still reaching out with his glory. The law was preached to give recognition of sin. You and I should see the glory of God, the glory of Jesus, and how we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But he's also added his promise to this. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As that greatest bridegroom, Jesus keeps his vows. And therefore, there's no difference. We are also justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This free wedding present that Jesus Christ gives to you is a beautiful one. You're included as his bride, the church, which is described by St. John. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And from the throne I heard a loud voice that said, Look, God's dwelling is with people. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain, because the former things have passed away. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls that were filled with the seven last plagues came and spoke with me. He said, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He carried me away in spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It has the glory of God. Its radiance is similar to a very precious stone, like crystal clear jasper. The glory of God is given to you. As a husband shares everything with his wife, Jesus shares his glory, the glory he has as the only Son of God, with you. That is why he reveals his glory. So how can we say that his glory shines in our hearts so that we reflect his glory? It's because his spirit dwells in our hearts. Coming through the modes and pathways that God has promised that he would. The word of God is one. Baptism is another. And the Lord's Supper is a third. And you can be certain that in those three means... More certain than in anything else that the Holy Spirit in those things brings God's glory into your heart to shine there, to shine out, turning you into the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket. No, they put it on a stand and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine in people's presence so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so you see the Spirit of God's glory shining in the lives of Christians. The fruit of the Spirit. 
is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This glory of God given to you by the miracles of Holy Scripture, Holy Baptism, and the Holy Supper is imperishability and immortality. And so we know, clothed and filled with Jesus' glory, we have the life of his resurrection as well. This abundant wine symbolizes the abundant joy that he gives us with his eternal life, so that our cup overflows. It's his wedding present with us, with his eternal promise. And we can be totally confident in that promise. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to everlasting life. Amen. Our service continues with the offertory on page 70. Ooh. 